Hey guys and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. I'm John and today we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of me making a presentation for you guys, I'm going to be looking at a video that I watched last night. And uh, this is allegedly Dave versus a particle physicist uh, flat earth debate. So I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I wasn't satisfied with what I saw in that debate. So I wanted to go over it and instead of the particle physicist answering, I wanted to give my answers to the questions. So if you guys want to see the particle physicist answer the questions, I am going to be linking the video in the description. Uh, so you can go watch that later if you want. But uh, for now, I'm just going to go through the video and we'll, uh, we'll just answer the questions one at a time and see how it goes. So let's start off this video right here. So maybe Dave, I was over to you and I was just going to ask you maybe what some of the the sort of the leading points in your mind why you think the obviously earth is flat okay leading points well the, the first most obvious is the complete lack of curvature um, no matter how much we try and, and find the pesky curvature we can't find it you know um, as I said I expect um, I uh, mentioned the curvature calculation which on a 25,000 mile um, circumference should be 8 inches per mile squared that's the amount of drop that you should experience. So um, armed with that calculation, you can go out and, and you know, if you have a, uh, a landmark, uh, a known distance away, preferably over the, over the sea, because obviously there's nothing in the way, um, you, you can do sighting experiments to see how much you're supposed to be able, you know, you're supposed to, be able to see. And uh, I guarantee you, you'll see much more than you're, you know, you're supposed to be able to see. Um, so between that and uh, and the gyroscope, that's that's. Okay, so before we move on to his second point, um, I want to talk about the curvature that he just mentioned because really there are tons of experiments. I mean, if you look at history and the experiments that were done way back. Um, a lot of those experiments were made without the use of instruments or, uh, you know, sophisticated instruments. So the curvature has many, many different ways of being seen. You can use, uh, you know, just, I, the other day I was watching a video of a guy who um, only took two sticks that were the same height and uh, it had a meter on it to measure the shadow. And all he did was use those two sticks and use his bike to bike around 138 kilometers. And between those two points, he could measure the difference in shadows. So that's what he did. And the measures that it gave him uh, gave him an estimate that was within 15% of the actual measure, which is pretty close to what um, uh, Eratosthenes did way back in uh, ancient Greece. So it, it was very similar to that. Today we have a lot more uh, experiments that are, are much more uh, precise. So uh, we, we know that the value is a lot uh, more accurate today than it was back then, but he still got about the same results. And this is just one experiment. There's a lot more experiments and things that uh, can't be explained with the flat earth model and are uh, very easily explained by a uh, rotating planet like the movements of the sun, the way that the sun rays shine and can shine under the clouds, um, all of these things. And so if you actually go out and you look for those experiments, you can find a lot of them. So not being able to find curvature is not a very good excuse in my opinion because there's a lot of stuff that you can do and a lot of people who want to test this out because they're literally curious about the results they always prove the curve and for some reason no flat earther ever proves the curve so probably some of them do it but they uh, they just discard their results because they don't want to re-examine their beliefs or something like that. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but the it's very it's very easy by doing a few simple experiments, like the guy with just a bike, a, a bike. Uh, that's it, bike and two sticks, 
and you can do a lot of stuff like that. So anyway, let let's move on to his uh, second point here. My my pet one, um, the gyroscope has a property called uh, rigidity in space. That means once it's set spinning, um, it will stay in its orientation no matter what you do with it, regardless of, of gravity, regardless of where it is on Earth. It will stay in its uh, original orientation, you know, re and, you know, according to space. So, um, so you get aircraft have uh, a, a gyroscope. They they always have a mechanical backup gyroscope uh, in uh, in their artificial horizon. So, how it works. So I'm kind of going to stop it here because it goes pretty in depth about the inner workings of a gyroscope and um, it, it's not really that important. Um, you know, you can go look at it yourself and you'll see how it, how it works, but it doesn't really uh, back up his point that much. So what he's essentially trying to say here is that when you uh, set up the gyroscope initially it stays in its original position and then when you start curving around the earth it should start going back on itself but it doesn't do that so he's essentially asking why does it not do that and um, the reason for that is you can actually go online and see uh, gyroscopes and how they function and one of the videos that uh, you can find is a gyroscope where the person is uh, making sure that it's completely misaligned, like completely. And what it does is in about four minutes, it's able to find its level again. So when you're talking about something that can adjust from a very, uh, very off uh, point uh, down to a perfect level in about four minutes, this is a lot faster than the 0.5 degrees that an airline uh, or that an aircraft has to dip its nose. So you, it's gonna be able to adjust much faster. So it's always gonna keep that reference to the ground pretty intact so that the aircraft can always find the horizon. So this is a self-adjusting thing. It's not something where as soon as you set it, it keeps its direction in space uh, the whole time it keeps its reference to the horizon to the earth and it all it's always adjusting like that so uh, we'll go ahead and continue here I might skip a little bit here I was, I was just gonna say before, before uh, jump in um, I'm sure you have some points on that later <laughs> yeah did you? I mean I was actually gonna I was just gonna dive straight in now and I was actually gonna because I just want to give you a bit of time to sort of introduce yourselves e e to the topic yourselves what what you think about what you think about it but I would love to now just basically just open it up and just sort of get straight in the deep of it and allow yourselves to maybe if you have any questions for Dave, if you have any questions for Pierre. Dave, can I ask you, Dave? Um, Dave, what would you make of uh, what Pierre says there about the various different space organisations that have taken photos of the Earth and it is actually shown a sphere? Right, well, the first and most obvious question is why does every single um, photograph of the Earth look different? If you put them all together and look at them, every single one looks different. The answer, the answer to that is with, uh, with the, uh, a guy called Rob Simmon, who actually works for NASA, okay? Um, and his job, as he describes it, and you can find this on YouTube, um, is, is creating images from data, yeah? So they get, supposedly they get, he gets a load of data and he creates a, a, a a picture of, of earth from this data okay so what he's talking about here is when you have either satellites taking only parts of um, of the globe in pictures you have to then take those and sort of stitch them together so when you take a 3d object and you want to make it in two dimensions transformations have to happen in the same way as you can't get a you can't take a basketball and cut it and then make it flat on the surface of a table it just doesn't work it's always going to want to have bumps in it so when you transform it into a, an accurate 2d representation there needs to be a few uh, little transformations there to make it accurate and when you have all of these pictures put together and you sort of put it 
on a globe, you're still going to have some little gaps there. And what he, uh, what Rob Simmons was doing at NASA is that when it was stitched together, instead of having holes everywhere, he would just fill, fill those in a little bit. So it's not like he photoshopped the entire Earth. He's just filling in the holes from that 3D to 2D uh, uh, transformation. So it's not like it starts from absolutely nothing and is just made from uh, the imagination of someone using Photoshop. The other thing is that he's talking about how different it would be, uh, how all the pictures are different. Well, there's a lot of stuff that come into play here. Um, first is the distance from the Earth that you're taking the picture. You can test this on a globe and if you watch Simon Dan, he actually took a few pictures of that. So what, what's happening is when you're close to the target, like let's say you're very close to the globe and you take a picture, then the, fa the front facing part of the globe is going to take up a bigger part of your entire view. So it's going to look like if you're zooming in on, uh, well, if you're not zooming in at the beginning, but if, if you're very close to North America, it's going to look bigger when you're very close to the target. But then if you move back and you start zooming, the fact that you are further back means that you see more of that globe because of the rays of light that are traveling to you. There's more of them of the globe that gets to your eyes or to the camera. So when you zoom in after that, the central part is going to look smaller because it's taking less space in your field of vision. So it's the same globe, same everything. Only the fact that you're a bit further away and zoomed in means that you see more of the Earth. So this is uh, something that can be <clears throat> very easily replicated uh, in anyone's home as long as you have a globe and a camera. And... Um, as far as the colors go, then that can depend very much on the instruments that you're using to capture that uh, image. So if you're using a specific camera, a specific lens with a specific uh, image sensor, or maybe you're just capturing the light with uh, non-digital cameras, uh, there is a lot of stuff that can come into play here. and. On top of that, you have all the different settings from the camera itself that you can manipulate. So there's ve there's a lot of different ways. But another thing that is important to mention is that the first, the original blue marble pictures, uh, picture, there, there's a lot of them that were taken, but the original blue marble was the first one that was snapped with a camera by a human being. And it was the first one that was practically completely lit. The other times there was a lot of pictures taken, but they were not completely lit. So it wasn't as um, as impressive, I would say, even though it's still a nice accomplishment. But that original blue marble came well before the first um, the first CGI was ever used in a movie. And that was in Westworld in, 19, in 1973, which was one year later. And I'm not completely sure of the entire particularities of the process but essentially what they had to do was to transfer it using film because nothing was digital so they took one film and they uh, used some assembly code which is the most basic uh, code you can use to give instructions to the CPU so it's very complicated it's very long to do and they were transferring from film to film like that so it was probably uh, why it was so pixelated because you had to probably take care of most of those pixels or you know transformations or something like that so that was a very very bad quality so making a picture that stands up to scrutiny in 1972 and that uh, many people analyzed to see if there were any signs of doctoring uh, it, it's a, it's authentic it's a good picture it's um, nobody's been saying i don't think anybody's been saying that this one has been uh, you know doctored unless they're flat earthers so this is uh, so the pictures are essentially uh, pictures that couldn't have been made. So 
he he just doesn't seem to want that and he goes on to talk about the fact that there's cgi and all that but if you just look at uh when photoshop was made and when uh, the first 2d cgi was made you j just doesn't add up that was well before that so anyway let's continue but it's not only about nasa right well there's I'm, chinese all European, the others Indian, too Japanese. all of the others too they're all getting but in why, on the why act. would there be this sort of consp like conspiracy what why what what would these people gain to do these well, sort of things on the on the really base level okay nasa gets something like 58 um billion um so like, is it 58 billion a day or something oh no 52 million a day 52 million dollars a day okay that's enough of a of a um you know a, a reason to do these things just on its own there are other reasons for it but that's uh, you know that's the one that most people can actually um, understand. Yeah, if they were getting fifty-two million dollars a day, right? Wouldn't wouldn't you fake it if you could get if you can convince people to give me give you fifty-two million dollars a day, and all you have to do is give them photographs? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Okay, so the money part, it, it still. Even if I, I, I haven't looked at the actual figures of uh, NASA's budget per day or anything, but I just know it's much lower today than it used to be way back in 1970s. So 52 million a day. This is taxpayer money. And there's a lot of people that make decisions up there. It's not just the president. It's not just uh you know it's not just one to three people there's the whole uh house and congress and uh you know all of that and there's a uh, with all these people making these decisions all of these people would have to agree that uh okay let's keep lying to everybody and let's keep putting that much money into something that's just uh a pure lie and this doesn't include uh you know going into all the amateur astronomers and uh, everybody on YouTube and every single article on the internet and uh, you know everything that talks about a globe, everything that makes uh, clear observable measurements of the curve and things like that. There's uh, a ton of stuff. I mean, National Geographic just did one about flat Earth about two weeks ago, so. Uh, you know, were, were they being paid by NASA? I don't think so, you know, and it, as Pierre was saying, uh, Pierre is the astrophysicist, uh, the particle physicist, he was saying that it's not just NASA, it's every government agency. And another thing that you forget, uh, it's that it's not just that, but all of history too. Like NASA getting paid does not explain in any way why since 300 BC we've had experiments and uh, that were showing that the Earth is a sphere. And then by 300 AD, everybody was um, uh, agreed that the Earth was a sphere. And by, well, all the authors also that were educated were all writing about a spherical earth in 300 AD, which is 1800 years ago. And by the 8th century AD, there was absolutely nobody uh, or no cosmologist at least that was uh, questioning the, the sphericity of the earth anymore. And that's, you know... <laughs> It's an extremely long time ago. So how does NASA's budget explain all of these things, all this change in, uh, all this progress in science throughout our history? It, it, it just doesn't make sense. Let's continue. No, I'm saying that this idea that, you know, as something goes away from you, it will go over a curve, yeah, because you, you lose the bottom of it, yeah. Uh, no, on a flat surface, yeah, you can you can actually um, repeatedly demonstrate how just walking away on a flat surface it appears as though somebody is disappearing below a curve. Yeah, but they're not. Obviously, they're on a flat surface. Yeah, I've got I've, I've right. done a couple of videos that show that that effect. Yeah. So, so I mean, okay. So over here, he's talking more particularly about mirages. And those happen when you have a big air difference between 
uh, the air that's very close to let's say uh, the water and the air that's right above the water. So when you're looking at a distance, this mirage is gonna make it appear as if uh, let's say the boat that's on the water and that you know that's on the water, it makes it appear as if it's floating because you don't see uh, the touching of the boat to the water because of that mirage. The same thing happens when you are on a very hot road and you put your face to the ground and you look at a distance. You'll see that uh, you won't see the cars on the road. You're gonna see them kind of floating up there because of the mirage. But the thing is that the mirage doesn't explain all the ones that we can see where you can only see half of something. So you can see oil rigs, you can see big boats like cruise ships and things like that where you only see half of it. Um, they never try to explain that. All they do is use mirages or uh, another thing that they can do is there are experiments that you can do that allow you to see further than you should be able to see. So there's, I don't remember the name of the experiment of that one, but there's a very calm canal that has a very long straight uh, place where you can look at. And when you take the camera and you look at, let's say one or two feet right above the water, you're able to see further than if you're at 10 feet above the water. Because when you're at two feet, the refraction is uh, is enough to let you see a little bit more, uh, a little bit further than you would at 10 feet with the angle that 10 feet has. So you, there are ways to manipulate to allow you to see a little bit further than you should. Part of, uh, well, a good example of, of that is the world record picture uh, that was taken from Pic Finestrel to Pic Gaspar. Um, so when you take a, a look at that, you see that they use refraction uh, to their advantage and they're able to see further than they should. But when you look at that canal, the first experiment uh, attempted to prove a flat earth. But when you're at two feet above the water, you're able to see further. When you're at 10 feet above the water, you can't see as far anymore. So instead of taking that two feet and saying, uh, the earth is flat because I'm seeing further than I can. You should be taking it at two feet, three feet, four feet, and you know, up to 10 feet or even more. And from all those results, what it's gonna tell you is that the curvature blocks your field of view for let's say three feet and up and you only have the two feet to explain. You know, when you're trying to use things to your advantage all the time, it's not a single experiment that's gonna prove the Earth is flat. It's the complete failure to prove uh, that it would be round, that w it would make it uh, possible for it to be flat. And then you could start doing a bunch of experiments like that. But in science, we never try to just find one proof for something. It's when we try to disprove it so many times that we're never able to, that's when it becomes true that's when it becomes solid. So uh, what else was being said here? Uh, I think we'll just continue at this point. The, the height is taken into account. You can go out online and get the earth curvature calculation. One of the parameters you have to put in is your eye height. Yeah, so it's taken into account, okay? I've got pictures of the White Cliffs of Dover from, um, from uh, Calais or Boulogne, I can't remember, Boulogne I think it is, yeah? It's uh, 31 miles away from the White Cliffs of Dover, yeah? The eye height is 30 feet, yeah, that's where the picture was taken. And with the Earth the cliffs, calculator... The cliffs are way higher than that. I right? know, I know, I know. But with the, when, you Can you plug see the those, of the cliffs? when you plug those figures in, yeah, it should be... Um, 353 feet should be hidden, yeah? So Pierre was asking the right question here. Can you see the bases of the cliffs? And uh, he just answered that you can see three, uh, that 300 feet or so should be hidden. So let's just continue and hear the rest of it. The, um, the cliffs are 350 feet, yeah? And yet from that picture, you can see the base of the cliffs. You can see the, all of the cliffs, yeah? What I'm saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making stuff up here. You, we can, anybody, any of us can go out and do our own experiments, yeah, 
plug in the, the, the figures into the calculation and see, no, I'm, I'm not supposed to be able to see that, but I can see it. There it is. I... Okay, so uh, I'm not sure about this exact picture that he's talking about. I haven't seen it myself, but every single time that I've seen uh, other pictures like that that were claimed to be uh, flat earth or something like that, it was always extremely easy to see why you were seeing what you were seeing. And very often what was happening was they're taking, um, they're taking a cliff and maybe it's, I don't know, uh, let's say 3000 feet high or something like that. And they're measuring and what should be hidden was maybe 200 feet. So then that 200 feet that's hidden, it doesn't really show if you don't put the pictures either on top of each other or side to side so that you can see it hidden. Your mind doesn't really remember the last little few percent of the base of the mountain. So to you, it looks as if it's about the same. But when you overlap them, you always see that you're clearly missing the base of the mountain, which is what Pierre was asking, which is the right thing to ask. So I'm not sure about this exact pictures, uh, this exact picture that he's talking about, but uh, I suspect that like every other one that I've seen, it's very easily explained. Another thing that you could do instead of taking a mountain and uh, trying to see if the base of it is hidden, try to get a mountain where all of it is hidden. There's so many pictures that you could take to do that instead of, you know, making one where it would be very easy to uh, mistake it for not being hidden, try to do one that would make it more obvious. So let, let's continue here. And, you know, again, you can take what that into the, consideration. But what is the error on your eye height? Like, what is your error? Like, what is it plus or minus 10 centimeter? Is it plus or minus two meter? Is it plus or minus? Where are you standing when you do this sort of calculation? Okay, when you do the calculations, you, you go you know, to sea matter. level, because I said most of Sea them. level, but you know, you have tides, what do you actually no, stand sorry, on the beach? sea is level, no matter where it is, yeah? The sea, <laughs> that's why it's called sea level, yeah? Water yeah. finds its own level. Yeah, but yeah? like... So if, you're, if you go down to the beach, yeah? Uh -huh. And you measure up from sea level, no matter what the tide is, yeah? Because uh, the water's okay, going to be level. The, same, the side is the same opposite. Right, it's going to okay, be... Right. right, so you know the, the height above sea level, right? So then you can do... So I would, I would say there is at least two or three meter in errors in the sea level. Okay, let's... Doing let's Okay, so uh, what Pierre is saying here, he's kind of estimating a little bit, but he's got a good point here. It's if you're standing on the beach, uh, instead of actually standing on the beach, imagine that you have a glass of water and you set it on the table. When you have that glass of water on the table, yes, Dave is right. In that case, it would find its level. It would stay uh, pretty still. And you would also have a little meniscus on the side of the glass because of water adhesion to the glass. But other than that, the middle of the water, of that glass of water, would pretty much be level. But now, if you took that glass and you moved it slightly to the left and abruptly, you'll see that it's no longer leveled. It's kind of bending around the glass. There's waves in there. And the sea is exactly the same thing. The sea is not something that is completely... Uh, still. It's something that has waves. It's something that has bulges in places. There's tides and things like that. So what Pierre is saying is that when you have an eye height of let's say 10 feet above the water, you have to take into consideration that there is a margin of error in your calculation that you have to account for. So let's say that the uh, the sea looks pretty calm, then maybe your margin of error might be just, you know, one meter or something like that. The, the maximum of the bulge that might be obstructing your view or the minimum, it, it changes your results pretty significantly when you're close to sea level. So you have to take into consideration all of these things. So that was uh, his point here. And let's just continue on this one. Like let's this. let's right? assume I, I you're do. right. Let's assume you're right. <laughs> but, Two or three meters. Yeah, difference. but your eyes. What is your eye height, right? The eyes. Is that sorry? I missed what your eye your high height, height yeah. right? Is one and a half meter or one hundred and eighty centimeters or something, okay. right? 
So the error is already bigger than your than what I'm not, yeah. No, no, no. Is that I'm, not true? No, like, because as I said, you, you plug waves, in. Right? You plug in the actual eye height. You measure your eye height above sea level. Yeah, that's one of the things you do to to get the right calculate the right value. Okay, you include the eye height. Okay, it ca it calculates what that curve. So your eye height is in between zero and three and a half meter. It's because you have waves and you can't measure exactly where you're standing on the beach exactly like. Where is the actual sea level? Yeah, so this is uh, what I was trying to say also. It's that there's always movement in the water. So even though it might look like the water is at your feet, somewhere else it might be a little bit higher, somewhere else it might be a little bit lower. And uh, it's, not, it's not one sea level as soon as you touch the water that is sea level because otherwise somebody else will have a different sea level than you do. Anyway, let, let's just continue on that. So, you, that. You will find that is inconclusive, essentially. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's what you're saying, yeah? But, yeah, I mean, but it, as I said, we can go out. You can go out and, we're, we're, you know, unless you want to do the, the scientific thing and fudge the figures, yeah, add in a, a constant, yeah, <laughs> which, which uh, you know, scientists will want to do. Oh, yeah? I mean, sure Add in a constant. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's add in an error constant. And uh, Oh, no, no, oh, no. no we the, can see. the error constant is... Is, no. is inherent into science, right? We can't do science if there's no error calculation. That's I, just... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We if have I, to have that. If we have a circle, right, we have... Okay, so he's talking about the error constant and things like that, but I think this is a little bit of a misunderstanding between these two. I think what Pierre is saying that you have is that you have to account for all the uh, errors that you might have in your experiment. And uh, when you're using something that's online, that's just uh, putting in numbers about your height and a circle, the... Um, what happens there with those calculations is that you are not taking into account that not everything is completely still. So what Pierre is saying is that you have to account for the differences in tides and things like that. So then uh, Dave, what is uh, I think he's trying to say here is that we're constantly changing uh, science and uh, math not so much and it's completely different than science but um, that's kind of what he's saying here is that when we're adding stuff to, uh, to science all the time. So if something, if something doesn't seem to work out, we're doing something else or we're adding something to the calculation to make it more complete. And this is something that many flat earthers keep saying that, uh, this is something that makes us not be able to count on science because, uh, you know, it's, it's all wrong and, uh, we're, always just adjusting science to our observations or things like that but this is exactly why it's good because we're not uh, fixated on staying in one place anything that w uh, we can explain better we're gonna write down so it's the same as if let's say you're uh, looking at the sun and you say the sun is yellow or maybe you know in ancient Greece Maybe they wrote that down the sun is yellow and then you figure out that the sun is maybe slightly more orange And then you write that down you kind of replace your uh, uh, Your your previous Hypothesis because now it seems to be a little bit better and things like that and you keep doing that over and over and eventually you get to some very very specific stuff and now we if we're looking at the color of stars or of our sun now we can calculate the exact wavelengths of the light that's hitting our camera or whatever so uh, we got a lot better at doing that and now we could say for sure that our sun is yellow to white and that's because of the colors that are hitting our eyes in our visual spectrum and uh, so so it's just that we're not changing science to make it fit what we want we're changing science to document our observations and our understanding better and that's pretty much it so it's not something that you can really say science is not good for it's science is better because it's adapting itself to the changing knowledge that we gain contrary to uh you know uh, 
things like religion where if you're really a fanatical religious person and you read the bible and you never want to adjust um your knowledge afterwards then it's it's gonna it's not gonna help you your personal growth is gonna be stunted or stopped completely science is always growing as we gain more knowledge so anyway that let, let's continue is there any other um maybe any other questions you would like to ask each other as well maybe just draw a line well, on I, that I, for now I, I'm, I would like to address uh the saying that uh you know um why is the earth um, flat and everything else in the sky um, round? Yeah. Now, um, Pierre said that um, that you know you look you've looked through the telescope and you've seen um, spherical objects up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, mm, that that's where I've got a problem because you know it takes two eyes to to render three D. Yeah. So if you're looking at something through a telescope, you can only see it in two D. It's a blob of light. It's not, it's not spherical at all. If you see anything spherical with one eye, right, you're making that up. <laughs> Seriously, right? You can but only, you can only how, render 3D how, with How would eyes. that look like then? Okay, so um, what Dave is saying here is not completely wrong to render a, a 3D object and get that uh, perspective change on the object where uh, you can clearly see that it's three-dimensional. You need two eyes to do that, otherwise, with a single eye, you're only going to see the world in two dimensions. So uh, it's also the same way that cameras work when you do 3D movies. You have two eyes for those cameras. And uh, the little parallax there is going to help you uh, to uh, make a, a 3D scene based on what you're seeing, the same way that our eyes do. So he's talking about the looking into a telescope and seeing only with one eye. So uh, the, the thing is that you can also look at pictures. Let's say that you're looking at pictures of a basketball, right? And this is going to be a picture that's on your computer or a physical picture. It's still in two dimensions right there. But there are things that you can look at in that 2D representation that shows that it's a sphere. The way the shadows are hitting the ball, the way that it's casting a shadow, the you know things like that. And when you look at Saturn, you don't really need to have three dimension because everything that it exhibits is uh, based on a spherical shape. So if it was just a line, the shadow would be different. The um, uh, the the sun that's hitting it would be different the ring around it would be different and wouldn't cast a shadow and you know there's a lot of stuff that you can see from a 2d representation that says clearly okay if it exhibits these traits it's because it has to be spherical and that's uh, you know it's not really you don't really need to be right over there and see it it's like if it quacks like a duck and acts like a duck and, and talks like whatever it's going to be a duck but even if you know you said you categorically said no they're they're spheres you know if you've got a um you're on a basketball court and there's lots of basketballs you know is the is the court supposed to be a, a sphere just because there's all these basketballs around no this is a special place no 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 <laughs> this is different right we've made the basketball and we've made the tennis court so that doesn't apply, right? Well, somebody it's made something, this place. something which is mediated by, you know, holds together with gravity is always wrong. Okay, so uh, that was a good point from Pierre again. We made the basketball, we made the court, so it, it doesn't apply. And this is something that keeps coming up in the flat earth uh, community. They keep saying that all the time, but it doesn't apply those are not made by nature and uh, when you look at things that are made by nature uh, the spherical shape and we knew that way back in ancient Greece it's um, when you have things that are all tending towards the ground uh, towards the center the effect of that is that if everything is doing that the end result is gonna be a sphere and we can see that with asteroids and things like that so um, uh, anyway, it's uh, that basketball court and basketball's uh, example just uh, simply doesn't work. It, if you look at anything outside of us, it's always going to be acting in the same way. And we can predict all that stuff and we can um, 
we just know pretty much everything of where things uh, are right now, where they used to be, where they're gonna be in the future, and uh, it, it's just anyway. Let, let's just continue. Sorry, gravity. Oh, that's another. <laughs> okay, gravity. that's another topic. Okay, yeah. I mean, go ahead because I'm not sure. Because on on well, maybe we'd I'd have to explain that, but. On the flat Earth, right? If there is a gravity, then you're attracted towards the center of mass, and the center of mass is in the center of the of a disk. So it's like literally, you know, in the center of the disk. And as you move, for, you know, on the side, then if you're attracted towards the center, then that means the gravity starts to pull you, um, well, in a slanted w <laughs> way, essentially. So you'd have to like sort of climb towards. It'd be harder and harder to get to the poles, for example. Okay, that's but that's that's only um, you know according to a theory of gravity. Which theory are you talking about? Because it sounds very much like Newtonian to me. Okay, so this is one of the things that annoys me the most from the flat Earth community. It's that whole thing about uh, gravity is just a theory. So we're gonna have to get that straight. It's um, okay. First of all, let's start with Pierre's point here. Pierre was saying that if you're on a disc and you have gravity uh, that's at the center, then when you get to the edges, it's going to be pulling you in a very slanted way. And I, I, I saw a video on this where they did all the calculations and they did a model for it to show you how steep it gets when you get to that point. And when it gets to that, it would be like... Uh, almost 90 degrees or actually when you get to the absolute edge you're at 90 degrees so you're standing uh, sideways now and before then you're extremely steep so it gets harder and harder to get to the edge so uh, that it doesn't really work so they have to use instead of gravity they have to use something else and they keep saying that gravity is just a theory but no this is something that is extremely wrong it's a wrong assumption gravity is a force so if you take something and you simply drop it when you drop that thing it's not just gonna go uh, at a linear rate towards the ground it accelerates and for anything that accelerates you need to have a force that's acting on the object it's it's how acceleration works so the force that is accelerating the object, we call it gravity. You can call it magic. You can call it a banana if you want. It really doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't change that the force actually is there and exists. If you try to remove that, then you have to re-explain how acceleration works. And probably the majority of everything we have today has some sort of acceleration in it. So we have to know this very, very clearly. And you'll have to re-explain all of reality if you deny acceleration. So this means that the force actually does exist and it's there. We decided to call it gravity. So let's just continue with that name. Yeah, so with gravity, you have the force that is... Uh, there and it's calculatable and it accelerates the objects that are falling so we know that the force is there now what we documented what we we examined that force we calculated that force we tested that force we used predictions for that force um, and everything is uh, perfect so we know exactly how gravity works how this force works so what we wrote on paper for our understanding, for uh, the speed at which it accelerates, for all of these things that we wrote on paper is the theory part. So we have the theory of gravitation, which is our understanding of it. But even if we were completely wrong about that and we wrote gravity works in the wrong way and all that stuff, it still doesn't change the fact that the force actually exists and it's there. It's not what we wrote on paper that's going to change reality. So this theory thing, uh, the gravity is just a theory and all that stuff, just stop saying that. It just it makes no sense. The force actually exists. The theory is only what we put on paper based on uh, how we measured everything about that force. So let's continue here. Yeah, right, well, this is 
well, New Newton has been proved to be absolutely completely wrong. Right? Einstein came along and created a different model, not based on, on mysterious forces between two objects. Yeah. That's okay, so uh, this is something that I hear very often also, is that Newton was completely wrong, uh, but this is completely wrong. Newton was not wrong. Newton was able to calculate almost everything with his theory of gravitation or uh, his uh, law of universal gravitation. So the only thing that he couldn't explain was very specific things like the orbit of Mercury, why it had processions and things like that, but everything else was working. So Newton was not wrong. He was very close to explaining uh, a lot of stuff. So when Einstein came and he uh, essentially replaced uh, the Newton, uh, well, Newton's gravity, it's because he was able to imagine it in a, a slightly different way uh, that bends the space. So when you have a big mass in space, it actually bends around it. So uh, it can affect the path of light, it can, uh, you know, do all sorts of things, but that it was just a slight re- reimagining of the effects of gravity in space. So when he did that, it only explained a few things that Newton was not able to explain before. But it's not like Newton was completely wrong about everything like Dave is saying here. Newton was, uh, he was very good. He was, he was able to uh, make us have a lot of progress from this knowledge. And then Einstein just came in and Com you know, made it a little bit more complete and then it started explaining a ton of other stuff also. So it made us all the better for it. And, uh, you know, in the future, something might happen also where, because um, Einstein right now, we know that it works for anything that is uh, a big scale, but when it goes down to quantum scale, it doesn't really work anymore. So in the future, we're probably gonna be able to unify those and be able to explain reality even a little bit better but that mean it doesn't mean by any means that einstein is wrong he just didn't have uh you know the absolute complete answer to absolutely everything in the universe he's just explained it the best that he could at that point in time and now we we have to continue improving on that knowledge so anyway let let's continue it's no mysterious force. Einstein says it's a curvature of space-time. Yeah. Now, all, both of these theories are there solely to um, to allow this tendency of something to to fall to the ground when when let go. Yeah. Allow that tendency to to make it possible for somebody to stick on the bottom of a ball. That's the only reason. There's these theories. Uh, stick in the bottom. Of, I, I didn't. Okay, so we didn't make the theories to uh, try and prove that people could stick to the bottom of uh, a ball like he's saying. Uh, what we did was that we gradually gained more and more understanding about the things around us and the things in space and all that stuff. And the Earth anyway came, like we knew that the Earth was a spherical in like probably... 2100 years before Einstein which was in the 1900s so it has nothing to do with that we didn't use that to try and prove that we could stick to the bottom of a ball it's just it's just natural evolution of our knowledge and it led us there so anyway let's continue well you know the, the question a child asks the very first question what about the people in Australia won't they fall off well, these theories of gravity are only there to allow right, this tendency for things to drop when you let go of them to allow for people to be standing on the bottom of a ball. Yeah? We don't see any evidence of gravity. Yeah? Gravity is supposedly a weak force. A sp yeah? The weakest out of all the fundamental forces, apparently. Yeah? Overcome by magnetism. The, and the, the Sorry. 
Yeah, so this is correct. If you look at the different forces, um, you have the different forces in the standard model. And in those forces, you have the, the forces that keep atoms together. So you have the strong nuclear force, you have the electromagnetic force, you have the weak nuclear force, and uh, I think I'm forgetting one too, but gravity is not even really part of this model. So if uh, this is because gravity is extremely weak, but when you have something as big as a planet or something as big as a star, the volume or sorry, the mass that's contained in that uh, sphere, in that planet, in that sun is so massive that you don't need big numbers. A very, very small number is going to let you stick to the ground. If, the, if gravity was a tiny bit uh, stronger, then we would be crushed under our own weight or we would have evolved very differently to be able to stand up or move around under such tremendous gravity. So anyway, let's, um, let's just continue here. By overcome by magnetism. But what does that well, mean? Well, the uh, standard experiment or, or uh, demonstration of how weak gravity is, is that somebody will um, get a magnet and lift up a load of paper clips and says, well, you know, this magnet is overcoming the, 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 the oh, force okay. generated by the entire planet. Yeah. yeah? So um, it's, it's stupid. It really is. If Here's an experiment, okay? If you, but uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch how that would make gravity well, let, let me, let me a give, false force. Let me, let me show you an experiment. It can be, it, no, no. I mean, I think this is quite important, right? Well, this, sorry, is, this, this is, is like going. That something is weak doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Okay. So that's a very good point here. Uh, something being weak doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And when you have something that is um, weak, but it's based on something that is so massive, then you do start to see effects, even if it's very small. So <laughs> that was a good point. Right. So um, a vacuum is much more powerful than gravity. We know that because Mythbusters did a, a show where they used a standard vacuum cleaner to lift a car, yeah? Just like the magnet lifting, lifting paper clips, yeah? A, a vacuum cleaner literally lifted a car, you know? That power of that vacuum, only generated by a vacuum cleaner, not the vacuum of space, yeah? It was able to lift a car. Okay, so before we continue on that one, uh, first of all, I, I, I kind of doubt that it was just a standard vacuum cleaner. I mean, uh, maybe with a really good suction cup or with a vacuum cleaner that had a big motor in it, you could uh, create enough suction to be able to lift something very heavy. But what there was something that he said that is very, very wrong. He's saying that vacuums are extremely powerful and that's not the way that you should be seeing it. It's the way that you should be seeing it is when you have something like a suction cup and you're taking um, the air out of the suction cup and you're pulling on it, you're creating a much lower air pressure under the suction than you have around. So what's happening there is that the entire atmosphere is pushing on that suction cup. And this is the reason why it stays in place, why it doesn't want to move. So you're able to lift uh, quite heavy things. And the pressure that you have on the top of the suction cup is uh, calculatable. You can calculate that. You can see what, with what kind of pressure you have. Uh, you can make the seal a, a little bit more... Uh, uh, like you use a little bit of water, so you make sure that absolutely no air gets inside. And uh, yeah, so you'd be able to lift something pretty heavy, but you can calculate that. So if you do it with a car, you can reverse engineer that calculation and find out exactly how much of a suction you would need to be able to lift that car. And then you just perform the experiment and uh, you know probably prove it to be correct at that point. But uh, vacuums are not actively doing anything. The only thing that's happening with vacuums is that the rest of the atmosphere is trying to equalize. 
This is something that's always, always happening because of gravity. Everything is trying to find a, an equilibrium. So when you have a vacuum chamber and you open it up, uh, while well, the air is all going to rush in, but it's not because the vacuum is sucking it. It's because all of the atmosphere is pushing it inside really fast. And uh, so that's just something that is important to make a distinction about. So let's continue here because I think there was more to come on that one. Yeah, as soon as they switched the vacuum cleaner off, it fell. Right. So, so the point I'm trying to make is the, the vacuum generated by a standard vacuum cleaner right, mm -hmm. was able to lift a car on the surface of the earth, where the gravity is strongest, yeah, easily lift this, this car, okay? Now we have a, a vacuum, which is many times, orders of magnitude, more powerful than the vacuum generated by that vacuum cleaner, yeah? Okay, so I'll just say it again, just to make sure, but uh, I'm not sure where this is coming from, where he thinks that space is much more powerful. Maybe it's just like, his kind of common sense uh, telling him that space is so much more vast that it should be more powerful. But in reality, a vacuum is a vacuum. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have no pressure in that box or in that suction cup, they are both equivalent to each other. And one is not really gonna pull anything else, anything more than the other. So let's, let's continue and finish his point here. Mm. Acting on the atmosphere of this of this ball earth, okay? So why isn't all the atmosphere dragged off into space? Because, you know, when you, whenever we see a high pressure next to a lower pressure, there's movement from high to low, always. Okay, so yes, when you are on earth and you're doing that, you have uh, the whole atmosphere that is trying to uh, push on that box. Now there's, other uh, experiments that you can do where you have an enclosed box but with let's say two uh, compartments in there so one of them would be a vacuum and the other one would contain air for example and within this enclosure you could try to remove the 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 wall separating both of them in the middle and you would see that it would equalize throughout both so it kind of could look like the vacuum is sucking the air, but really all that it is is that you have the air pressure that is finding an equilibrium quickly. So what was, let's say the left side was a vacuum and the right side was air, when you remove it, then the right side that has pressure is gonna be pushing towards the side that has no pressure until it starts hitting the walls and starts to equalize and find its equilibrium. It's not the vacuum that's pulling on the molecules of the air, and that's a very important disti distinction to make. So let's, let's continue. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we've got a pressurized system, the Earth, right next to an unpressurized system, space and no movement from one to the other. Okay, so this is also something that comes up pretty often, but um, one thing to remember is that we don't have, like when you're at the ground level, you have one atmosphere. This is the pressure that we feel at ground level. When you go up on the top of a mountain, you might be at 0.5 atmospheres and you have less pressure and things like that. But when you go up to the very edge, you're gonna be at 0 0.0001 atmosphere and then you might have the vacuum after that. So there's the equilibrium is when you have like gravity in the center of the earth right now is pulling down on all the molecules that come close to it. This includes gas, it includes water, it includes rock, it includes iron, it includes helium even. So what's happening is that the denser material is going to want to make its way further down the bottom because gravity is pulling on it more. And when you have only one element like water, while water is going to be more dense towards the bottom as well than at the top. So when you're in an ocean, you're able to swim at the surface, but you wouldn't be able to swim uh, down at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. You would be crushed under that because there's so much water above you pushing down on you that it's just too much pressure. And the same thing happens with the air. We have one atmosphere, um, 
around the ground and when you go up and up and up you gradually see less and less and less and when you go to the very very edge which is just like you know a place that we decided to call okay this is the start of space you still have a few little particles there and the earth is constantly losing some also at that edge there's um you know, sometimes the sun is going to excite some atoms and they're going to start moving a little bit faster. And if they move fast enough, they might escape the pull of gravity at that point because it's weaker, it's moving too fast. So there's a little bit of leaking that is happening with our atmosphere, but it's very minimal. But there is some, like we do lose some molecules, some particles to space it, it does go out it's just not much because the force of gravity is holding most of them in place huh? and uh, since we already established that the vacuum is not sucking something into it and it's about an equilibrium this is the equilibrium it's that gradient in air pressure up to having almost zero air pressure close to the vacuum and then you just have the vacuum because no molecules are close enough to the earth for the earth to pull it so let's uh, I just want to make sure that <laughs> this was well understood so let's go on to uh, the rest of this Right, there's no barrier in the way, apparently, yeah? So there should be a movement. And I, the only thing that's uh, supposedly stopping this movement is this weak force called gravity, which we've, I've already just shown is overcome by a, just a, a piddly little vacuum generated by a vacuum cleaner. Okay, so I think I've already pretty much explained uh, what he's saying here. Uh, I already gave the answer to that, so I'll just skip over and find the next question. Another distinction that I want to make about uh, pressure is to make an analogy about, uh, let's say, a bicycle tire. So when you have a bicycle tire that you put a lot of pressure in it, it's going to be higher pressure inside the tire than outside where you're standing. So when you let the air out, you're going to see it want to rush out uh, very fast. So when you... Uh, so So it's not really the air around you that's sucking the air it's the pressure inside the tire that's pushing it out really fast because it's always trying to find an equilibrium so you can imagine that instead of the entire earth and all that and it just makes it a bit easier to know that it's not the vacuum that's sucking the air or it's not the air around you that's sucking the air from the tire it's the pressure inside from all the molecules bumping each into each other very fast that is gonna push them out eventually they're gonna find their way because they're uh, under a lot of pressure in there so let's continue Okay, so let's imagine this table's uh, the Earth, and we've got the atmosphere here. And right now, there's no vacuum um, attached to it. So let's say it's not thin. It's the vacuum. The, the the atmosphere is like full strength up here as well. Okay, now we apply a vacuum. Right, the the molecules at the top start to go off into space, yeah, because they're right next to the vacuum, yeah. So they go off, and now you've got a lower level because now you that this lot's been taken away, yeah. So now you're down here. Okay, now this is. Um, next to the vacuum that gets taken away and this is next to the vacuum and that gets taken away and so on all the way down until there's no air left okay so if you started with a full atmosphere near the vacuum what would happen is not that the vacuum would be sucking the air it would be that all the molecules bumping into each other would make them take up more space. But you can't forget that you have gravity acting on, the, on those mo molecules and they're all trying to be pulled towards the center of the Earth. So the bumping into each other would make, up, would make them take up more space, but it wouldn't just... Uh, well, some of them would eventually fly off because they're too far, but then you would end up with maybe a little bit less atmosphere and it would still be pulled by gravity. Like the only things that are uh, against each other here is that gravity is pulling them in uh, like inward and you have the molecules bumping into each other that might orient some of them towards the outside where some of them might escape but some of them might just go into orbit and things like that so what would happen here is that you would like anything else it would try to find its equilibrium so some of them would go out but then after that you would have a lot of them that would be staying and it would gradually find 
uh, uh, an equilibrium where closer to the ground there's more molecules because gravity is stronger there and it's pulling um, it, it, it's pulling more of them they're creating higher pressure and eventually you end up with something that is equal well equalized because it's so gradual that you end up with an atmosphere like we have now so another thing to remember is that at no point in uh, the history of our planet being formed was there ever a full atmosphere right beside a vacuum what happened is that when the solar system was forming there was a lot of stuff around with little molecules or little atoms there uh, a bit like interstellar stellar gas and they started to stick together through electrostatic energy so when they started to stick together they were able to attract even more and even more and that grew eventually it grew to a size where gravity starts to have an effect and then when gravity takes over it starts to be able to pull in more stuff without the need of that electrostatic energy so it keeps growing keeps growing and eventually when you pull in a lot of rocks and you pull in a lot of um, air molecules and all that you start to have uh, a planet where the rock is closer to the center of gravity and you have the air around it that's sticking to it because of gravity and eventually it starts to kind of form into a sphere because uh, you can't have an extremely high peak somewhere when it's being pulled on more so it kind of always ends up forming a sphere because everything tends towards the center uh, uh, the, in the same way so uh, as we grew and as we gained more and more of these particles of air and all that it just uh, formed its equilibrium and it just stayed like that but at no point was there ever a full atmosphere right beside the vacuum so let's continue here i'm saying i'm just trying to to see what is the actual conclusion okay i'm saying that uh, we don't have gravity we have density and buoyancy an experiment of um, the thought experiment I'll give you here mm -hmm. is imagine if you had just uh, I'm gonna stop it here before he continues because there's something I want to address here that comes up pretty often with flat earthers it's uh, density and buoyancy and if you imagine that you have a glass of water and you put a bit of oil in it what's gonna happen here is that the oil is gonna float on top because it's less dense than the water that's below it and the reason that this happens is because of gravity gravity is pulling on the denser molecules more than it is pulling on the um, on the less dense oil so the water takes the bottom portion and the oil takes the top portion if you did not have gravity and you can see some of these experiments done on the international space station uh, without gravity that's pulling on everything at the same time you don't have this separation of stuff you if you mix the water and the oil it just stays mixed you need to have gravity pulling on all these molecules and having more of an effect on more massive molecules like water than it does on the oil otherwise there's no force there to separate them so let's continue um, a gas bottle yeah an empty gas bottle and you you weigh it and then zero out that weight so the you know the gas bottle um, is, is reading zero on the scale yeah yeah so you just zero it out so you, you're ignoring the, the weight of the gas bottle and you fill that gas bottle with one pound of helium okay mm -hmm. so it'd be filled with liquid helium and you can measure it so it's a, a pound yeah Evacuate that helium, that pound of helium, into a balloon. Mm -hmm. Hold the balloon and hold a, a pound weight. If you let go of them, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to fly. The balloon's going to go up, the weight's going to go down. They both okay, so this is uh, accurate, actually. So it's the same example as I just gave with the water and the oil. So if you have a pound of helium, what's going to be happening here is not that not just that the helium floats what uh, and that the the uh, what was he saying a, a block of wood or iron or something and that would just drop so they're both a pound but what's happening is that you can never forget 
about the atmosphere that's surrounding you. So gravity is pulling on all molecules, so it's going to have a greater impact on molecules and atoms that have more weight. That's why iron is at the core, that's why rock is above that, that's why water is above that, and that's why air is above that. So uh, when you drop, even if they're both a pound, what's happening is that the air is not dense enough to support the block of wood or uh, metal that he's talking about. So this one is more dense, it's gonna go down. But the helium is less dense, so as soon as you have it in your hand, the what's happening is that gravity is trying to have the atmosphere replace the space in the balloon, because right now this is not an equilibrium. So as you let go, gradually the air is gonna take up the space from where the balloon was and it's going to be pushing it up gradually until it finds a point where either it stays at that elevation because there is equilibrium or it's going to well what's probably going to happen is that it's going to keep going up until there's not enough pressure and the pressure inside the balloon just makes it burst so that that's what's happening here it's not just a universal force of down and simply de density that's uh, doing all the magic here it's gravity pulling on heavier atoms more than it is on the lighter atoms so it's finding an equilibrium as with uh, every other experiment let's continue you know when you if you if you went to the einsteinian model yeah einstein the einsteinian model it is a curvature of space and time yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a, a massive object and it's curving space so that if you try and go past it, space itself is curving towards the, the Earth, say. And, you, you know, you try and go past it in a straight line, you'll curve towards the Earth. And that's the that's why, you know, you, it's not really a force. It's literally a curvature of space. Yeah. OK, so uh, this what he's saying here is actually accurate. So he did do some. Uh, good homework here, which I, I think is uh, is a very good thing and probably more flat earthers should take his example and uh, do that more. So uh, I still think that maybe he was, uh, he didn't have a healthy dose of 50% uh, flat earth, 50% science, but uh, regardless, at least he did look into the science and maybe it's just that he can't quite explain uh, what's happening here but what he's saying about uh, space-time is accurate this is the uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity what it says is that in what Newton what Newton was saying is that the masses always uh, attract each other you know it's uh, it's universal everything does that so what Einstein is saying that is that on top of that you also have the fact that massive things are also well not necessarily just massive things but it's easier to observe on massive things is that it also bends space-time around it a little bit so when you have light going right past uh, something that's massive like when you're uh, one of the best observations that was done uh, right near the beginning of that uh, of when that theory came out is the observation of an eclipse so if the eclipse is a full uh, solar eclipse and you're still seeing the rays of light bend around and still get to you this is because there's uh, an effect on space-time which uh, light always wants to travel in straight lines but this is clearly bending and this is because gravity is bending the space around it uh, slightly so uh, what he's saying here is, is accurate and uh, let, let's continue with uh, what else he's saying. Well, that's really interesting, but what actually causes the movement? Yeah? Sorry, what, the movement? The movement, no. Um, Einstein's describing a curvature of space that says if you try and go in a straight line past the Earth, you're going to curve into it, yeah? You're, tr you're still going in a straight line, it's just that space itself is actually curved. Okay, so I, I think he's exaggerating this part a little bit because there is a curve, uh, but it's not a, a curve that will make you fall into the earth, especially if you're not traveling at the space of light, uh, at the, sorry, the speed of light. 
So if you're traveling at the speed of light and you're passing close to the earth, then your path is going to bend slightly and your direction is going to change slightly. But it's not going to make you fall into the earth. The earth is not... Um, it, it's not massive enough to be able to pull in light. The only thing that is massive enough to do that is a black hole because the pull of gravity is so high there that there is absolutely no form of radiation that can escape that pull. So if you come past the event horizon, there is no escaping it anymore and light and everything else just gets trapped there. But when it comes to a planet like Earth, it's only a slight bend in the path of light and that's been measured many, many times. Uh, well, again, um, as I said, if, if, you, if you had the, uh, the, the bowling ball in the middle of a trampoline deflecting you know, deflecting the, uh, the the trampoline down towards the bowling ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say it's uh, it's in space. Let's imagine there is space. Yeah. And uh, and that that trampoline is in space away from the Earth. Okay. So now there is no Earth pulling that that marble down toward. Yeah. If you put the marble next to the uh, right next to the uh, bowling ball, it won't move because there's no no um, tendency to go downwards to make that marble move towards the uh can you see what i'm saying yeah yeah so okay so this is um i'm not sure why exactly he's doing that because the experiment he's proposing just doesn't make sense when you're on earth and you're trying to show on a trampoline that if you have a bowling ball in the middle and then you start moving a marble around it, it's just an example, a, a small experiment, probably more meant for children uh, to more easily understand what's going on. But um, when it comes to space itself, he's talking about a downward motion. The thing is that we the first thing that we examined was that galaxies are moving away from us and the, the farther they are the farther the the faster that they're moving away from us so by this observation of what is currently happening and what keeps happening when you see something is going towards a direction what you can also do is trace it back to how it happened and then you can verify all those to see if they match up so what was proposed when uh, um, that was Hubble, that f uh, pretty sure that was Hubble that found the, um, uh, that all the galaxies were moving away. Uh, it's either Hubble or Kepler, I can't really remember right now. But then somebody else proposed that if this is what's happening right now, we can trace it back to a, an initial event that we can call the Big Bang. And everything with that checks out. So when you have the Big Bang that's exploding, then what's happening after that is that everything in space is also in movement. There's nothing really standing still because it started off with... Uh, you know, movement as the explosion happened. And then after that, you have something that is accelerating that movement that we don't yet know exactly how to explain. But this is what's happening and this is what's observable. So when our uh, solar system was forming, everything was also in motion. So when you have, uh, you know, the sun forming and it's starting to... Uh, exert a lot of gravity and things start going around the sun and uh, the earth starts forming and it starts gaining more uh, more gravity as it gets bigger and you know kind of uh, catches everything that's lying around uh, th this is all in movement so there there doesn't need to be a force going down to make it go around because an orbit is only something that is falling at the same speed that it's moving away. Like if you had a cannonball and you shot it at and there was no resistance, you could actually make that cannonball orbit by uh, if you shot it fast enough that it's as fast as it falls. So this is what an orbit is and this is how it all formed in the beginning everything was in movement some stuff started falling towards the earth but it didn't actually fall towards the earth because it's moving as fast as it's trying to fall so it stays in orbit same thing for all the planets around the sun and same thing for you know the sun around the galactic center which is a supermassive black hole and everything is like that everything was always in movement to begin with 
So there's no real acceleration anymore so we can't really feel it but in space there is definitely movement because it started off as an explosion so let's continue normally if you if you get an anvil yeah one of those big ant metal anvils yeah and you you let go of it it's gonna it's gonna hit the floor pretty quickly yeah mm. if you get a metal anvil and drop it in a bath of mercury guess what it floats Okay, so this is the same thing that we've been talking about before, how the core of the earth uh, has the iron and then it's rock and then you have water above that where it's denser at the bottom than it is at the top. Then you have the air at the top of that and it's just the gravity is acting more on uh, atoms that have a heavier mass. So when you have something like... Uh, his experiment here where an anvil is uh, is floating on top of mercury well that's just the mercury being uh, you know the, the a little bit heavier or denser than the anvil so it's not any different than if you have the water and the oil it's the same thing happening here a mysterious force or a, you know curvature of space-time to explain it the only thing um, if you you know that you do need a curvature of space-time or or mysterious force is to explain how people can stand on the bottom of a, of a ball. Doesn't still explain that explains why stuff should float, right? Buoyancy, density explains yeah. why it goes down. Okay, so I, I can understand a little bit why uh, Pierre here seems puzzled because density doesn't do anything without gravity acting on it so he's probably trying to process how to even answer something like that so anyway let, let's just continue uh according to what like well, what, what is what like i don't understand what is the actual force that makes us go down that makes my pen go down it's not it's not doesn't need a force it's what density is? it's it's just you can see the same thing if you get if you get a, a just a balloon with air yeah put it on water it will stay on top of the water. Yeah, but yeah? there is a, a, an actual... Okay, so again, the, what he's trying to say here, what, what Dave is trying to say here, it doesn't make sense because density on its own is not a force. It's uh, a property or, uh, you know, it's, it's not a force. And for acceleration to happen, you need a force. Uh, density is not a force. You can have things that are dense that are not moving at all. And, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense what Dave is trying to say here. Density cannot replace gravity because density requires gravity to do its job. Let's continue. You know, paper it over with lots of calculations and mathematics, but fundamentally it doesn't make sense. Our senses tell us what this earth is, yeah? It's, our eyes tell us it's a flat surface. Our senses tell us we're not moving, yeah? Um, and before anyone says... Uh, you know, uh, you should only ex uh, feel acceleration. Well, when you're moving in a circle, that's acceleration. You're always constantly accelerating. Okay, so um, <laughs> it seems like Dave knows what uh, science says in advance because he's talking about the acceleration. And it's true that we don't feel, if we have a constant speed, we don't feel acceleration, uh, we, we don't feel the speed. We only feel the acceleration that got us to that speed or, um, you know, deceleration is the same thing. It's a form of negative acceleration. So what he's talking about here is that if we're spinning, we should feel like they get very often stuck on that 1000 miles per hour thing. But really, it, you have to break it down in this manner. The earth rotates once on its own every day. So it takes 24 hours for one revolution. What kind of uh, force, like a centrifugal force, would you expect from that? I mean, it takes 24 hours to do one revolution. So people actually were curious about that and did go do the measurements. And what's happening is that there's about a 0.3% in weight. That's what's happening there. If you count that the, uh, that the Earth is a very slightly imperfect sphere in an oblate shape, then uh, 
when you figure that into the mix, it's about 0.5% of weight difference. Huh? This means that the difference in weight if you're at the North Pole or the South Pole and the equator is 1 over 200. So if you weigh, let's say, 200 pounds, it would be as if you weigh 199 pounds. It's a very, very slight difference. Huh? And what you are feeling is more the acceleration downwards from gravity pulling on 199 pounds of you than the one pound that is now trying to kind of sling you outward. So there's no way that you could feel that little change in uh, in weight and in movement and all that. It's just very slight. It's it's too subtle. So. And he was also saying about the, uh, like we experience it flat and our senses and all that. Well, when you take a sphere and you zoom in enough into it, it, it will have no difference than something being flat. It's just that, you know, when you're so small on something so huge, it, you just won't see the curve. That's just, you know, it's just common sense. And, um, and I forget what uh, the other thing that he was saying. So let's just continue on that one. Well, you, you also mentioned uh, the Coriolis force, which is interesting because it's not a force at all. It's a, an effect. Yeah, it's um, it's like you get two kids on a on a roundabout. Yeah, being spun around. Yeah. And one kid rolls a ball to the other and that ball appears to the other kid appears to 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 make a, a, a deflection to one side, yeah? But it only appears to it, because if you're looking from above the roundabout, yeah, that ball is going in a straight line. There's no force being applied to it. It's just the appearance of that ball, the appearance of that ball to the people on the spinning system. There's no force, yeah? So, so the idea that um, this Coriolis effect, yeah, can, uh, change the direction of uh, of hurricanes yeah it's a lie because there's no force involved it's a uh, just an effect and they just made this idea of a force you know calling it a force so that it uh, might sound like it will affect the course of uh, of hurricanes yeah Th that's it we we don't observe a Coriol coriolis effect you know they say that snipers have to um, account for the curvature of the earth um, because of you know not curvature of the earth but the uh, the movement of the earth yeah because it would deflect the bullet one way or the other but um no we don't see it the only uh, the only reason that bullets sometimes do um follow a, a slight curve is called the magnus effect which is bullets are um, fired from a rifled barrel which make the bullet spin yeah and when a spinning object is moving through air it'll, it'll be deflected just like um, David Beckham can kick a ball and put spin on it and allow that ball to curve around in a circle, you know, in a, a nice, neat curve. But yeah? those are okay, so um, basically everything that he's saying here is, uh, I haven't looked very deeply into that, but uh, again, one revolution of the Earth is only uh, once every 24 hours. So I'm not sure what you expect to get from a bullet that's in the air or to the target in maybe like one second or uh, probably less, less than that in, more, in most cases. So I'm not sure what exactly you'd expect to see, but if you're aiming for a bullseye, uh, this won't change the fact that you'll still hit the bullseye. If you do some very long distance upwards and uh, you know, you're shooting upwards and it's gonna stay in the air for several seconds, then there's a lot of other things that you need to calculate also because the air is moving with the earth. So what kind of effect is that going to have on it and uh you know on the downward trend it's going to have lost velocity so you're going to have to figure that in there's uh it's just not a, a very good example because for uh things like that the earth is not spinning fast enough uh to do the same thing as the example as the kids on the roundabout or whatever that's called so anyway i think we're Almost done here. Let me just see if there's anything else. Sorry, um, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, we I'm, I'm, I think we're all freezing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. 
Okay, so that that was pretty much the end of the debate. And at this point, I kind of feel bad a little bit for uh, Pierre here because uh, he seems to be extreme, <laughs> extremely cold. They seem to be in cold weather right now. I think everybody's freezing. But all I keep looking at is his hand that's completely white since a few minutes ago. And he's probably a little bit distracted by that. And uh, he's been blowing into his hand for probably at least 5-10 minutes at this point. So anyway, that, that was kind of fun to go over. It's um, I'm not sure if it's something that I'll do that often. But this time, I, I just felt like we needed to give better answers to the questions that Dave was asking here. And uh, hopefully it gets to uh, you know more people. But... Anyway, this is um, this is pretty much all that I had for you today. And if you guys like this uh, format, I can probably do a few more things like that, like screen caps. Right now, it's because I'm doing a sort of upgrade for my sort of studio, which is uh, meant to bring you guys a bit higher quality, but I got stuff on the way and I couldn't really record myself today. So I thought I would do this instead. So if you like the format, uh, maybe you can just let me know in the comments and I'll tell you, uh, I'll see if I can do a little bit more of stuff like that. That's less of a presentation and more just me talking with you guys. So, um, that's pretty much all for today. So anyway, it, you know, as usual, if you want to follow me on Twitter, or Facebook, you can do that. Uh, I would appreciate if you subscribe. I'm getting close to the 1000 subscribers. So this is awesome. <laughs> and um, yeah, so anyway, I think that's going to be it for today. So I'll catch you guys on the next one. Until then, respect your intellect.